last several weeks. So let us go to Ephesians chapter 6 and continue our study of the warfare that God has in store for us. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Well, we have been looking at the Lordship of Jesus Christ over the last several months, or a couple of months, and part of submitting to his Lordship is understanding we are engaged in spiritual warfare as our king desires to see his kingdom expanded upon this earth. So he desires for us to expand his kingdom in a world that is in opposition to his reign. And we need to remember that as we expand his kingdom, there is an enemy out there who desires to destroy us and to destroy our children. And so we need to be prepared to engage in this warfare. Whether you engage in it or not is irrelevant. It's happening. The enemy is coming after your children. Your enemy is coming after you and your soul. He is constantly tempting you to sin, to turn your back, to compromise. Well, last week we looked at several passages of scriptures that teach us that, you know, from the beginning, you know, there in the garden to the very end, there's going to be conflict. There's going to be war between the saints and those who are, at, who are in opposition with your king. The Bible uses language such as warfare. The, the, the Bible will use language, language such as, you know, soldiers and duty and responsibility to point us to the fact that we're in this warfare. So the warfare we're engaged in is that of exposure and pulling down with the intent to pull, pull, you know, to build back up. In other words, we are there to expose falsehood, lies. We're there to expose uh, all those things that are uh, that are opposed to the king's desire. We are to pull down. We we have weapons of warfare that Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 10 that are mighty for the pulling down of strongholds, for the pulling down of everything that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. Every institution in this secular land today has set its face against God, has set itself above the knowledge of God, and it has infiltrated the church. And so we have to wage warfare. We're to expose, we're to pull down. Why? So that we build back up, and when we build back up, we build on the rock word of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I want to encourage you, because some of you, you know, it's in your prayer request, We've been talking about this for a long time. Some of you are in opposition or in warfare. Some of you have conflicts, even with people that are close to you. I want to encourage you, this is not abnormal. You should expect this. This is what a saint should, should expect. One writer said it this way. If we are walking worthy of our calling, in humility rather than pride, in unity rather than divisiveness, in the new self rather than the old, in love rather than lust, in light rather than darkness, in wisdom rather than foolishness, in the fullness of the spirit rather than drunkenness of wine, in the mutual submission rather than self-serving independence, then we can be absolutely sure that we will have opposition and conflict. When you think about it, it shouldn't, shouldn't surprise you that we're in conflict because the Lord Jesus, he was in conflict constantly. His ministry starts with conflict there with Satan in the wilderness, and his ministry ends with conflict with the enemy crucifying him upon the cross. But let me remind you, in each account, Jesus comes out victorious, doesn't he? And the one thing I take away from the life and ministry of Jesus is that our obedience, as our obedience increases towards him, so will the attacks of the, of the wicked one. Satan will intensify his efforts against those who continue to effectively serve the Lord. So as you grow in one area, you know, Satan's going to attack in others. Satan is constantly trying to find where your weakness is. Constantly is Satan is constantly trying to find in your armor, where there's a chink in your armor, where there's a place where he can get to you. He is relentless. 
right? And so this is why you're instructed constantly. Be watchful. Be on guard. This is why we can't let our guard down, right? Satan will attack you in areas of your life where your allegiance to him is the weakest. Let me say it again. Wherever your allegiance to, to Christ is the weakest, that's where Satan will attack you. Right? So let me ask you, where have you been attacked in the last several months? Then that's where you're the weakest. That's why he's coming after you in those areas. So don't be caught off guard. We have to purpose that we will love, we will serve, we will have an allegiance to Christ above all else. How else can he get to you? If you have set the principle that your allegiance to Christ in all areas of life is, is supremely the highest, you are fully committed to him in every area of life, how can he come after you? He doesn't have anything to tempt you with, does he? Let me just say this. Once you get serious, once you purpose to submit to him in every area of your life, Staying on the battlefield, staying stable on the battlefield, not wavering. It will get easier. Now, I'm not saying the battlefield gets easier, but staying stable does get easier. So we should expect that obedience will lead to further attacks. And the Bible's telling us we shouldn't flinch in the face of battle. Luther said it this way. If I profess with loudest voice and clearest exposition every portion of the truth of God except precisely that little point which the world and the devil are at that moment attacking, I am not confessing Christ. However boldly I may be professing Christ. When, where the battle rages, there the loyalty of the, of the soldier is proved to be steady. It is mere flight and disgrace if he flinches at that point of attack. We don't flinch. So we have covered within the scriptures, that it is absolutely normal for the Christian to be in conflict, and spiritual warfare is normative Christianity. Let me ask you this. What happens when we don't like conflict? What happens when we shrink back? Well, then you see what you see in the PCA. You see what you see in the Southern Baptist Convention. You see what happens in the Anglican Church. You see what happens in all these once in the Methodist Church. Some of these denominations that maybe we have some doctrinal disagreements with, but these denominations were at one time conservative. They held battleground, historically speaking, and they have all given it up. Why? They don't like conflict. What's happening? I'm going to give you a, a clear example of this. What's happening in the PCA church today? You have some men who are tired of watching what's going on in there, but instead of fighting battles, they just leave. Now, what's going to happen when they leave? They're going to pull away because they don't like the being uncomfortable and telling someone else they're wrong. They're going to leave, and then what happens in about 10 to 20 years, it'll happen again. Why? Because they don't like the conflict. We shouldn't, within this assembly, find it awkward or, or something odd happening when we wrestle through disagreements. We've seen it here in, in the past, haven't we? Somebody disagrees, they get their feelings hurt, and they just leave. So what happens when they go to the next church? Does it get better for them? No. They have a trend and a historical pattern that says, I don't like the opposition and conflict, and when it gets too difficult here, I'll just leave this church again. Christ has not called us to flee any battlefields. We're to stand and hold the ground. And it's okay when we disagree. When I say disagree, it's okay that we're having the conversation. All right. This is what happens when we think that conflict is bad or conflict is not normative for the Christian. We just leave the battlefield. And Christ says, no, you stay on the battlefield. You expose and pull down everything that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. So we've covered that the Bible teaches us that conflict, spiritual warfare is normative for the Christian. But let me take some time this morning to get you to consider an area where we're to wage war that maybe you really haven't thought about. I want to keep pressing corners that maybe there's some corners you're not in. You weren't even aware those corners were there. Did you ever consider that what we do here this morning, what we've been doing this morning is warfare? Have you ever considered worship is warfare? Think about it. Congregational worship is not a spectator sport, is it? I mean, this is why I always find it awkward when we go to the church and they got these huge choirs and they got these uh, big singers that come up there and they sing to you. And what, what does the congregation do? They spectate. They watch. That's not warfare. It is so awkward to have someone come and sing to you. But the people of God, we're conducting warfare when we worship. And so worship, when we see worship as warfare, then we are to engage. And then now the congregation, you, you have something to do here, right? 
We come to get a job done. We come here to offer up something. Remember, Jesus tells us the gates of hell cannot stand against us. And remember, the gates of hell, they're not a, a, an offensive weapon. We are pressing the gates of hell. We need to see ourselves as the ones who are on the attack. We are on the offensive. Every week we come in here and take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. The engine that drives us forward in that regard is the worship of the triune God. And all of God's people participate. Each time we come together, we're taking another swing at the gates of hell. That's what we do when we come here. I want you to think about it this way. When you come up here and proclaim and glorify and exalt the name of God above all other names, especially your own, you're waging war against Satan. He doesn't like it. And this is why he'll come after you, particularly on this particular morning. He'll come after you on a Sunday morning where he won't come after you on other mornings, right? Because other mornings, you're probably just getting up doing worldly things anyway. But when you focus, you purpose to wage war, to come to worship the triune God of the scriptures, he'll come after you. And we've all experienced it. Each time we come in here, we're taking another swing at the gates of hell. And what we're proclaiming is we've got him surrounded. We have him right where we want him. Now, I realize this may be something new for some of you to think through. Some of you are still sitting there puzzled. Is it true that worship could be warfare? Well, remember, the Lord is the Lord of hosts. What are hosts? They're his armies. He's the Lord of armies. Our Lord inhabits the praises of his people, according to Psalm 22. When we praise God, he inhabits our praise. I want you to think about how the hymn book of the Bible, what's the hymn book of the Bible? The Psalms. I want you to think about this. As I have been placing these studies and thinking about spiritual warfare and how to bring these teachings to you, I'm amazed at how many times I'm brought back to the psalm, right? So when we think about the psalm book, the, the hymn book of the scriptures, which is the psalms, the writer of the psalms, they have enemies. They come against their enemies in singing and praising and exalting the name of God. I want you to just keep that in mind. Many of the modern day hymns, many of the modern day worship songs that are out there today have no enemies. Think about the lyrics. Think about what's being sung out there in many churches. It's not warfare music. But I want you to think about the victorious nature of many of the old hymns. You know, some people say, well, you know, why, why do you guys, you think only in the 16 and 1700s, those hymns are the only ones worthy of singing? No, they're not the only ones. But they are dealing with spiritual battle in a way that many of the songs in the last century and this century just do not deal with. They sang about the victory of God over their enemies. But the Psalms, which is one of the reasons why we've been, you know, I've been, you know, introducing these different Psalms to you each month for two reasons. One is to put the word of God upon your heart. You, you can memorize the word of God by singing. it. So as we meditate upon what we sing, we're meditating upon the word of God. That's good for you. Number two, these Psalms are all about warfare. Okay. And so I want you to just look at some Psalms. Let's, let's just go back. Let's just do this survey. Look at Psalm 3. Now let me ask you, if you are found, you find yourself in a church that is that, that brings impotent, compromising preaching, the worship is impotent, would you ever expect to sing these types of songs? Psalm 3, look at verse 7. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you have struck all my enemies in the cheekbone, and you have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Infinite worship, compromising preaching, those types of churches would never sing this kind of thing. Turn to Psalm 58. Psalm 58. Psalm 58, look at verse 6. Break their teeth in their mouth, O God. Break out the fangs of the youth of the young lions, O Lord. Now, I hope when I just read a couple of these verses, you go back and read the context of the of the psalm and go back and read it, right? Turn to Psalm 68, Psalm 68, look at verse 1, let God arise, let his enemies be scattered, let all those who hate him flee before him, as the smoke is driven away, so drive them away, as wax melts before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. Psalm 83, Psalm 83, look at verse 18. This whole psalm, you know, 
back in verse 13, oh my God, make them like a whirling dust, like the chaff before the wind, as the fire burns in the woods, as the flame sets the mountains on fire. So pursue them with your tempest and frighten them with your storm. Fill their faces with shame so that they may seek your name, O Lord. Let them be confounded and dismayed forever. Yes, let them be put to shame and perish that they may know that you, whose name alone is the Lord, are the most high over all the earth. Let me just give you one more. We could do this all morning long. You know this. You've seen, you've read through the Psalms. You know they're there. Go to Psalm 149. Psalm 149, look at, uh, look at verse 6. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance on the nation and punishments on the people, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute on them the written judgment. This honor have all the saints. Praise the Lord, right? Now think about what happens when we sing this way. I mean, I want you to think about your kids. If they were to grow up singing like this, what are you doing? You're training them. You're training them to spiritual warfare. Now listen, you let your kids wander and stare off in the distance. You don't make them stand and follow along and sing along. You're not training them for anything, right? But if you want to train them for spiritual warfare, you teach them how to sing these songs. Think about the level of impotence you know, that are found in the modern church. And one of the things that we can attribute to uh, the impotence within the church is we don't sing songs like this anymore. We don't act like we have an enemy anymore that needs to be brought down and brought low. But listen, when we sing like this, you know, if, when, we, when we were singing through Psalm 3, if you had your children engaged, one of the things they should have done is ask you, why are we singing, Lord, smite my enemies and break their teeth? You see, this is what happens when we, when we don't even meditate on the psalm. Each week, I encourage you, meditate on the psalm of the month. What is it saying? Well, what did you think when you went through that text in, in Psalm 3 where it says, break their teeth? That, that's warfare language. Now, I hope you understand what the Psalms are teaching us. What the psalmist is doing when he writes this is he's saying, God, your enemies, they're my enemies. And what's the problem in the church today? We make friends with God's enemies. We let them stay safe in their state of rebellion and feel good and feel comfortable. I mean, that's the whole purpose of a seeker-friendly congregation, isn't it? The whole point of a seeker-friendly church is to make sinners feel okay in their sin. We need to be seeker-hostile. We need to be seeker-hostile. We need to make sure sinners, including us, do not feel comfortable in our sin. We're at war. we got to hold the battleground. We need to train our children this way. You see, when we don't train our children to grow up and be mature soldiers of Christ, then they just become adults. They just kind of sit back and give more ground to the pagans, right? And here's the thing. We don't mature and grow up our children by teaching them little kid songs, kiddie songs. We teach them the word of God. We teach them to handle the sword of the spirit at a young age. We train them with the word of God. Here's another aspect of spiritual warfare that the, the singing of these psalms teaches us. Just go back over to Psalm 5. So let's look at our psalm this month that we're working through. We're wrestling through this psalm. As we sing it, you should be studying it. You should be meditating upon it. You should be hiding it upon your heart. And then in Psalm 5, look at verse 4. What is this teaching our children? What does it teach us when we sing this song? Let me just read just a couple of the verses here for you. I mean, it's, it's all throughout it, but just look at this. For you are not a God who takes pleasure in the wickedness, in wickedness, nor shall evil dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand in your sight. You hate all workers of iniquity. You shall destroy those who speak falsehood. In other words, those who lie, you hate them. You'll destroy them. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and the deceitful man. All right, so what does this teach us? When we sing this psalm, what does this teach us about our God? This teaches us we must wage war on our sin. Think about it. When we sing this song, we're reminded that God destroys liars. Are any of you here guilty of habitually lying? Your, your, your tongue is comfortable lying? God says, I'll destroy you. See, you've got a real problem now when you sing this song and you've got, you have not repented of a lying tongue. Because now you're singing God's judgment upon your head. That's the problem with imprecatory psalms. Liberals hate imprecatory psalms because it's, brings, it's calling down the judgment of God upon sinners, right? Now, should we sing them? Absolutely, but you better be careful when you sing these imprecatory psalms. Why? 
Because if you have refused to repent of these sins, you're bringing, you're crying down the judgment of God upon your head. So, any of you got a lying tongue? You better deal with it. You just saying judgment to yourself this morning. There is no such thing as a white lie. Right? And that's a real problem in the South, isn't it? Okay. Your children need to hear this. If your children are guilty of lying to you, right? And you can see it with a young child, right? They lie to you. So it's written all over their face that they've lied to you. But then what happens as they get older, as their conscience gets seared, and they're getting more and more comfortable with lying, now they're able to hide the fact that they're lying to you, and they can lie with a straight face. You don't think this is important? You need to be training them at a young age to tell the truth, even to your own hurt. I hope you can appreciate singing these types of songs. That you know, you sing this. This you, you want a cure for anemic worship, impotent worship. Sing these songs. Sing songs that proclaim that there are enemies and we're waging war upon them. We sing songs that remind us that we are waging war against the gates of hell and it cannot prevail. Impotent worship does not wage war against the gates of hell. It just doesn't. It doesn't happen in here, and you'll never take it out. It won't happen in your family worship. It won't happen when you go out there and engage the enemy on the battlefield. Turn over to 2 Chronicles 20. 2 Chronicles 20. You're probably familiar with this story, but let's just put it in the context of warfare. 2 Chronicles 20, verse 1. It happened after this that the people of Moab with the people of Ammon and others with them besides the Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Then some of the, them came and told Jehoshaphat saying, a great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria, and they are uh, in Hazazon Tamar, which is in Gedi. And then Jehoshaphat feared, and he set himself to seek the Lord. He proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord. And from all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of the Jew of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord God, our fathers, are you not in heaven? And do you not rule over the nations and the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand there is, is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people, Israel, and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend, forever? And they dwell in it and have built you a sanctuary in it for your name's sake. If disaster comes upon us, sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this temple in your presence, your, for your name is in this temple, and cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save. And now here are the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade uh, when they came out of the land of Egypt. But they turned from them and did not destroy them. Here they are, rewarding us by coming out to throw us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Now all Judah, with their little ones, their wives, their children, stood before the Lord. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehazel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Methaniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, in the midst of the assembly. And he said, listen, all of you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid, nor be dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, go down against them. They will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz. And you will find them at the end of the brook uh, before the wilderness of Jer Jeruel. You will not heed or you will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourself, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear, be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them for the Lord is with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground and all of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed down before the Lord to worship the Lord. And then the Levites and the children of the uh, Kohathites and of the children of the Korahites 
stood up with the praise of the Lord God of Israel and sang with voices loud and high. So they rose up early in the morning and went into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and those who should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army. Who's going before the army? The choir, right? Praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Now, when they began to sing and praise the Lord, he set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. And for the people of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir to utterly kill and destroy them. And when they had made it into the inhabitants of Seir, they helped destroy one another. I'm going to stop here. You can read the rest of this chapter. I want you to understand one thing. Who is leading in the battle? It's the singers. And I think we can all agree that choirs have a different ch nature within the church today than what we see these men who are walking out singing praise to God in the face of the enemy. The singers went out. Fighting men didn't even have to fight. It was, the, it was the Lord's. Turn to Exodus 15. Exodus 15. You remember what happened over here in Exodus 15? We have this great song of Moses. You know, what happened before this was that uh, the armies of Egypt had been destroyed. But notice this song of victory. In verse chapter 15, Then Moses and the children of Israel sang the song to the Lord and spoke, saying, Now compare these lyrics to the lyrics you hear today. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. And the horse and the rider has he has thrown in the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. And he has become my salvation. He is my God. I will praise him, my father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has cast into the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. The depths that have covered them, they sank to the bottom like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, has dashed the enemy in pieces. And in the greatness of your excellence, you have overthrown those who have rose against you. You sent forth your wrath. It consumed them like stubble. And with the blast of your nostrils, the waters were gathered together, and the flood stood upright like a heap. The depths congealed in the hearts of the sea. And the enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire shall be satisfied on them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind. The sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? You stretch out your right hand. The earth swallowed them. You and your mercy have led forth the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them in your strength to your holy nation. The people will hear and be afraid. Sorrow will take hold of the inhabitants of Philistia. And the chiefs of Edom will be dismayed. The mighty men of Moab tremble. Trembling will take hold of them. All the inhabitants of Canaan will melt away. Fear and dread will fall on them by the greatness of your arm. They will be as still as a stone till your, your people pass over the Lord. Uh, pass over, O Lord. Till the people pass over whom you have purchased, you will bring them in and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance, in the place, O Lord, which you have made. For your own dwelling, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established, the Lord shall reign forever and ever. Do you believe that? Do you believe he's going to reign forever and ever? They did. Does the modern church really believe this? Based on the amount of ground they've given up to the unbelievers. We have a song of victory, right? After the victory. But notice there's an enemy that God has defeated. They were not ashamed of it. And in fact, they're celebrating the destruction of God's enemy, aren't they? They're celebrating the display of his power. Think about God fighting their battles for them. They rejoice and praise him for it. And, and, and I love what this says when it talks about the chiefs of Edom, the mighty men of Moab. They're all going to be trembling. Think about when Joshua and them actually go into the land and they come to Jericho. What are they saying in Jericho? They're coming. And their God is fighting for them. They are trembling in that mighty, strong, fortified city. And, and how did God bring down that city? They marched around it. They shouted with a triumph of victory. They blew some trumpets. I mean, think about when we go through the book of our study of Revelation. We'll see it in our study. I, I will go through it this morning. But what do you see in Revelation? You see worship in heaven. And as the worship of God is taking place in heaven, we see ungodliness being brought down upon the earth. 
When God's people worship him, kingdoms fall. He shakes the earth. And when he shakes, those things that need to fall, fall. Those things that are built upon the rock word of the Lord Jesus Christ stand. They endure. And if we can grasp this principle, it's going to change the way you come in here. It's going to change the way I come in here and worship. You see, when people, when God's people worship correctly, biblically, it's a provocation to Satan. It's putting him on notice. It's waging war. And, and what is Satan's plan? He wants to stop you. And so if your weakness is a bad attitude, your weakness is apathy and coldness towards the love, towards your with your love towards Jesus Christ, he'll use every bit of that to get you to come here and not participate and not wage war. If your weakness is you're tired, if your weakness is I'll just get around to it whenever I want to, he'll use every bit of this. He'll encourage you to sleep in. But his plan is to get you to stop. I mean, think about how many times he has sidelined you before you even got here. I mean, like I said, I mean, we're adults. We can be honest with one another. It's obvious on some of your faces you, you had a difficult morning getting here, right? You're not engaged. You're not singing. You're not, you know, you know you're staring off into space. We got to prepare for battle here because if you're not going to start it and do it here, you're not going to do it out there. Don't fool yourself. Don't kid yourself. So we have to prepare for battle when we get here. We come here for one reason, to glorify the triune God of the Scripture. We praise his name, and when we do that, it's a proclamation of war. And so when that happens, we sing together, we're declaring war. It happens when we pray together. Do you think of your prayers as waging war? John Knox did. Mary Queen of Scots understood that, didn't she? Mary Queen of Scots says she feared the prayers of John Knox more than 10,000 men. John Knox knew how to wage war even with his prayers. Now, what politician in this country says that about any pastor in this country? But you, you know where they do fear? China? You got some mighty pastors, North Korea. You got some mighty pastors that will pray, and the civil government doesn't like it. They lock them up. Some of you are too young to remember this, but you need to go back and study your history. Go back and look at what was happening in the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s in Eastern Communist uh, uh, Europe where the Russians had taken over. There were some mighty men who knew how to pray behind the, the iron wall, the iron curtain, and the communists would round them up, put them in prison, kill some of them. There are men who know how to pray. There are men who know how to pray in such a way that the government will take notice and fear. When Paul preached, so when we think about our worship, our singing, our congregational singing, when we think about our prayers, it's an act of war. When we proclaim the word of God each week, it's an act of war. When Paul preached, it was an act of war against the world, the flesh, Satan, all the things that exalt itself above the knowledge of God. I want you to think about how effective Paul was. He was effective even when they would throw him into prison. He never stopped fighting. And so impotent, watered-down, compromising preacher is not war, you know, preaching is not warfare. And we need to remember that when the word of God is spoken, things happen. So when a pastor, for example, proclaims the sword, you know, uses the sword of the spirit, what we're not interested in, not, not just me, but any pastor of the word of God, what we're not interested in is someone to come and say, well, that was an interesting sermon this morning. You really stimulated my intellect. Who cares? We're up here waging warfare. We want the sins in your life for you to confess them, to repent and turn from them so that you might stand firm on the battlefield. Pastor's desire is that through the word of God, you would hate sin more, hate the work of Satan more, and love God more and be drawn closer to Christ. A pastor's desire is that you would want to turn from sin and lustful appetites, turn from your pride, and turn to holiness and righteousness and purity and thought. And so when we preach the word, and not just when I preach it, even when you preach it within your home, when you proclaim it into the culture, you are declaring that there is a new king. Right? What's the problem we see within our land today? What's the problem within most churches today in their gospel approach? Well, many Christians see the gospel as something you offer, like to a voting pool. Why don't you just try Jesus? You know, you should make the wise choice here, because after all, he's better than Hillary. Right. You, know, you hear how the conservative right talks and speaks. It sounds just like the church and the way they offer Jesus. But what should we be proclaiming based on the scriptures? We should be proclaiming that Jesus Christ was coronated the king of the earth 
2,000 years ago. And he has come, he has established his kingdom. Now, what's the response of the citizens of this, of this earth? Come quietly. Lay down your weapons of warfare, stop your rebellion, and submit to him every area of your life. Now, what happens when you don't? He's going to cast you away. We sing it about it in our psalms, don't we? And so when this is proclaimed from the pulpit, and then you take that same very word to the culture, you're going to rattle some people. You're waging war. Here's another thing you need to get because I have to get it. As a pastor, there should not be one verse in the scripture I'm ashamed or afraid to teach. The one thing we learn from Jesus is he never makes apologies for God. He never makes apologies for anything God does in the Old Testament, does he? So neither should you. Once the pastor is not ashamed of any of the verses of the scriptures, then you can go out and not be ashamed of any scriptures in the, in, in, or any passages in the scripture. Yeah, but what do you do with all these passages where God just cleans out a whole society? Or what do you do when God executes real punishment against homosexuals or fornicators or adulterers? What do you do when the Bible talks about slavery? Well, you don't apologize for it. Everything our God does is good, just, and right. You start there. You start with your commitment to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, and he is a good God. So everything he does is right. You shouldn't have any problem with these passages. I don't have any problem with them, and so we take them to the world. But here's the thing. If you're ashamed of any of these areas, you have no message to give them. All right. So when there are no problem passages in the pulpit, then you're not going to have any problem passages to take to the world. Now, the only reason you would have a problem with taking passages to the world is that you're disobedient and you're in sin somewhere. So you're trying to compromise. You're trying to rationalize some sin somewhere. Okay. When there are no problem passages, then we can war wage war in here on the sins that confront us. Now, be careful. I want you to understand what I just said. I'm not here just to talk about the sins that are out there. I'm here to deal with the sins that are in here. Now, you know what some people say about that? Well, that's meddling. Yeah, but I get paid to meddle. You understand that? Yeah, but you're stepping on my toes. I know I get paid to step on your toes. Now, here's the beauty of the, re the relationship we have here. You could step on mine. If I'm in sin, you have to deal with it. You have to confront it, right? It's a two-way street. So what happens when someone comes to me and says, well, you know, you're meddling, you're stepping on my toes. Your, your, your examples are too specific. You know what my response is? I get paid to do that. And number two, did you repent? That's really the conversation, right? If you come to me and indict yourself by saying, my examples were too specific to you, then my response is, you're welcome. And did you repent? All right. Now, if you've got thin skin and you get your feelings hurt easily, you're not going to like any of this. But don't come and tell me how to do my job because my job is given to me here, right? We're going to deal with the sins that we're confronted with. And we're going to take the word of God and we're going to press it in these areas. Because if you don't deal with it in here, the world's going to push you. You can give up ground. I want you to uh, go to Hebrews 4, just so you know. I'm not making a lot of this stuff up. Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4, look at verse 12. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrows, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked to the open and, and open to the eyes of him. Notice this, whom we must give an account. Okay? The word is a sword, and just so you understand, my job is not to describe the sword to you is to drive it into the hearts of those who are called in this assembly to be here. Why? Because <coughs> each one of you must give an account. You will give an account to me, but you're going to give an account. So worship is warfare. Well, you may have never thought about our worship service in such a way, but once we understand this principle, it's going to change the aroma of our worship. It's going to change our attitudes towards worship. And then once you change the aroma once your attitude changes here then it's going to overflow into your homes it's going to overflow into the way uh, you deal with our culture think about it. it's going to change our times of fellowship 
But just think for a moment, what happens if we don't repent of impotent worship? What happens if we don't repent of compromised preaching and unengaged prayer when we come here? Then what happens within our home? What happens to our culture? Well, we see it. It's in front of us right now. The homes are destroyed. They're ripped apart. There's no real honoring of God within most of the homes in this land. Our culture has turned us back. They've asked God out of everything. There's no honoring and praising his name in the streets. There used to be, but not anymore. I mean, we've seen it. And so if we want to impact and wage war within our homes and within our culture, then where do we start? We start here. We start here. And so when we come in here, we have to trust God and we have to have faith in everything he says. And when we do, then we're going to leave here. We're going to have an impact on culture. I want you, Let me give you an example. Think about Abraham. It's an interesting case study if you just stand back and think about what took place in history. God calls this man out of Ur of the Chaldees, brings him into the promised land. Nothing but pagans, right? But what does Abraham do? Well, Abraham walks around the land. land. He has no children. He hadn't received the land yet. But everywhere he goes, what does he do? He leads altars. Does he? He wasn't concerned with what the pagan culture thought about it. He wasn't concerned that, well, the ACLU might be offended with these altars being laid all over the country. Remember, Jesus has now sent us out as living sacrifices to occupy this land. And so when we go out and we leave this building here, we go to occupy the land. We go to take dominion for God's glory. And so you think Abraham has some great stories to tell his son? Oh, yeah. Do you? You got any stories? You young men, one day you're going to have some children. You got any stories of the triumphs of God's grace to tell them? What area have you begun to occupy for God's glory? Well, think about that. As you prepare to come in here, it doesn't matter whether it's Wednesday evening. It doesn't matter whether it's Sunday morning. It doesn't matter if it's your family worship, your own private time of worship. You're waging war. You've got to think differently. I have to think differently about this. So go back to Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6. Notice what Paul says here. Verse 11. He says, put on the whole armor of God. Why? That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Well, last week we saw God's almighty power. It's his power, not our weakness, that fuels our faith and prepares us for battle. So how do we appropriate this power? Well, Paul says we should put on the whole armor of God here in verse 11. So to put on the whole armor of God is to appropriate his power in a most personal way, right? This verse directs us to do uh, what to do. So when I come to this verse, I see two things. Verse 11 tells me what to do and why to do it. So what's the what to do? The what to do is to put on the armor of God. Why should I do it? So that we can stand against the schemes of Satan. All right, so it's a simple verse, right? The structure of it, grammatically speaking, but there is a lot of implications here. Now, since every believer is exhorted to put on the armor of God, we have to ask, well, what is the armor? Well, first, the armor deals with, you know, like in Romans 13, 14, where Paul says to his readers, you must put on Christ. Christ, first and foremost, is our armor. One of the Puritans said it this way. The apostle does not exhort the saints to simply put on temperance in place of drunkenness or for adultery to put on chastity. Instead, he tells them to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, implying that until Jesus is put on, the creature is unarmed. Now, let me just ask you this. If you're here this morning and, you know, you really have not submitted to the claims of Jesus Christ, you have not submitted to his lordship and you know it. Even though you may have made a profession of faith, even though you may have been baptized, right? Set all that aside for just a moment. If you know you have not submitted to his claims, if you know that what Parker read this morning out of Luke 14, you, you didn't want to hear that. They want to ask you, what sin has grabbed you so tightly that you don't want to submit to him? What sin in your life do you love so much that you wouldn't submit to the Lord of glory, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Lord of the universe, right? We need to understand the armor, first and foremost, is Christ himself. We must put on Christ, Paul says. A Christless person is, a, is in a graceless state, and he is unarmed to resist Satan. Turn to Ephesians 2. You're unarmed to withstand Satan, but notice also when he's writing to these Gentiles, 
Paul is writing to these Gentiles. Notice how he referred to them in the past tense, that at that time you were without Christ. So Ephesians 2.12 that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having, uh, promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So notice they are in a graceless state. They cannot resist Satan. They're unarmed because they have not clothed themselves in Christ. Without Christ, they are alienated from God. So if you're not a citizen of the kingdom of God, then you're without God. You do not possess this armor. And since you're without this armor, you can't resist Satan. You become a tool of Satan. And as a result, you become an enemy of God. Now, that's a desperate condition for the unbeliever, right? He has left his own defense against his own flesh, against the world, and against the devil. One said it this way. He will be torn like a silly hare among a pack of hounds, and no God to call him off. Only Satan to urge them on. But when you're clothed with Christ, turn over to Numbers 14. You can respond like these men, like Joshua and Caleb. Notice how they responded you know, to you know, they're there, and it's just two of them. They're standing. It seems like they're just standing against a nation of people who are afraid. You know, they're not willing to go in and occupy the land. They're behaving like cowards, right? But in Numbers 14, look at what he says in verse nine. This is with them pleading. Only do not rebel against the Lord. How are they rebelling? They're rebelling against God by refusing to go into the land and take what was theirs, right? Do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land. Why? For they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. So when we have Christ as our armor, when we put on Christ, we have the boldness to confront our enemies. And so, you know, think about it this way. Would it be foolish to ride out into the battleground unarmed during a siege? You see... When we ride out onto the battlefield without our armor on, it means we don't understand our enemy. Another thing, if we fight without putting on Christ, then we're fighting in darkness. In Ephesians 5, 8, we read this. For you once, Paul talking to these Gentiles, for you once were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. So as a child of God, we are the people of the light. We are those who walk in truth. Remember, light in the scriptures is a metaphor for truth. Now, you may be walking in the dark concerning one particular truth or promise, but you always have an eye towards Christ who will lead you in truth. But here's the problem with a Christless person. A Christless person doesn't have this. They live in darkness. Unregenerate man is ignorant. They're powerless to resist Satan. But as warriors, we need to understand that darkness can only be dispelled by our union with Christ. And so when you see a loved one who is under darkness and alienated from Christ, what do you do? Well, you got to bring them the light of the gospel and you pray that God would open their eyes so that they could see that light. Well, we need to remember that Christ comes to us in our weakness. Uh, when we were out without strength, you remember what Paul says? Let me just read it to you in Romans 5. In Romans 5, verse 6, for when we were still without strength, in other words, when we were weak, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. I mean, you think about it. What can an unarmed person do against Satan? Nothing. You remember in Matthew 12, 29, where uh, Jesus says that he must enter in and bind the strong man in order to do what? To plunder his goods. And that's exactly what Christ does at salvation, doesn't he? He comes into the kingdom of darkness. He brings us into the kingdom of light. And then we are clothed with the righteousness of Christ. We are armed with true power. And I want you to understand this. He comes in and brings you out. Why? Because he's bound the strong man. Now, when someone refuses to put on Christ, that person is declaring himself a rebel and he's making himself an enemy of God. And if that person is an enemy of God, then he's a friend of Satan. The follower of Christ, the one clothed in Christ, is a friend of Christ. And when does this begin? It begins at regeneration. It begins where we are placed into union with Christ. This is where we put on Christ. So if you're here this morning, you're separate, you're apart from Christ, you're failing miserably against the temptations of Satan, the lust of the world, all these different things. If you're unarmed, you need to understand you cannot stand. And so you've been warned this morning. You must put on Christ. You must come to him. Well, 
Paul says in Ephesians 6, 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So putting on the armor of God starts first by putting on Christ at the moment of salvation. Now, I'm going to deal in subsequent verses here. Where we're going to get into the details of the different pieces of this armor and flesh this out. But just understand, it starts with salvation. It starts with, with regeneration. Now, when you read this verse, this whole armor is an armor that is provided by God. It's the armor of God. It's the armor that belongs. It's the armor that is sourced in God. So every detail is custom made for the battle that God has planned for us to fight. And you do realize, once again, going back on this theme, it's normative for the Christian to be in the con in conflict, right? You do realize there's no reason for God to give you this armor if there's no battles for you to fight. But God has battles for us to fight. Okay? He wants us to engage culture, to go after the enemy. All right. And since it's provided by God, it is perfect for the warfare that we are engaged in. And so this armor is meant to be worn by the Christian. One reminds us of this point. The Christian armor is made to be worn. No taking it off until you have finished your course. Your armor and your garment of flesh come off together. Then there will be no more need for a shield or helmet, no more late night watches. Those military duties and field graces, as I may call faith, hope, and rest, shall be honorably discharged. In heaven you shall appear not in armor, but in robes of glory. All right, what is he saying? Until you die, you keep this armor on. And when you step into the presence of the Lord, that armor will be set aside and you'll be clothed in robes of glory. So for now, we're to wear this armor night and day, keep our guard up, never let our guard down. I mean, we looked at this last night, but I mean, I hope this is making sense. Turn back over to 1 Corinthians 16. 1 Corinthians 16. <clears throat> Verse 13, these, this is the final exhortation of Paul to the church of Corinth. Watch, stand fast in the faith, act like a man, and be strong, right? So remember, the church of Corinth is surrounded by Greek and Roman philosophy and pagan idolatrous worship. All these things are going on. And remember, in the book of, of uh, 1 Corinthians, Paul is dealing with all kinds of sin because of that influence that had come into the church, and they didn't deal with it. You had perversions going on within there. You had divisions. You had uh, confusion over uh, relationship between, you know, the roles of men and women in, in terms of headship. All these different things are going on within this church, right? And so Paul is rebuking these sins, calling them back to be and behave like saints. What is a saint? A saint who is, is one who's been set aside and consecrated for the, the service of God, right? And he's calling them back to that. He calls them saints in the beginning, and so he's reminding them of who they are in Christ, and he's calling them back to that. And because, you know, if you go back and read in Acts, there was opposition from the culture because they had been successful in plundering the goods of Satan, right? There were real Corinthians in this church. There were real people who were guilty of all kind of vile sins that had repented and come into the church. And so when you start plundering the kingdom of darkness, there's going to be opposition from without. And so what is Paul? How does he end this letter? He says, you watch, you stand fast in the faith, you act like men, you be strong. And so we keep this armor on. We never let our guard down. Calvin said it this way. The Lord offers us arms for repelling every kind of attack. It remains for us to apply them to use and not leave them hanging on the wall. To quicken our vigilance, he reminds us that we must not only engage in open warfare, but that we have a crafty and insidious foe to encounter who frequently lies in ambush. I want you to stop for a moment and think about this. When, when John Calvin goes into Geneva to occupy it, Right? And strong Catholic foothold there. What was his source for the battle plan? It's this. You have everything you need to go and occupy this culture. You have the you have the wisdom of God, you have the weapons of your warfare right there. Right? Everything is here that we need to occupy this culture. You have everything you need to go after unbelieving friends, unbelieving family members. Everything you need is here. Okay. One stated this way, you must walk, work, sleep in it, talking about your armor, or you are not a true soldier of Christ. It's a pretty strong statement, but what do you think about people who don't wear their armor? They compromise, right, in, in, in every area of their life. They fall victim to the uh, temptations of Satan. This is why Jesus in Luke 12, 35 says, stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning, right? We must always be ready. And always be active in our duties. You think about this. 
The Bible tells you you're to pray without ceasing. You're to rejoice always. You're to give thanks for everything. And so we're to always be ready. We're to always be clothed with this armor. We must keep our guard up. And it has to be this way. Why? Because Satan's actions demand that we stay clothed in this armor. Satan's advantage is that uh, it is the greatest when he catches us sleeping. And this is the problem with the church today. A peacetime mentality is the worst thing we can have when there's a warfare going on. And always keep in mind that if Satan is so bold as to go after Christ, I mean, you think about the boldness of Satan to go after him and tempt him. Do you not think he will not hesitate to come after you and me? He scouted out Christ. He came to Christ after his fast, right? If the tempter watched, you know, watched Christ so closely, don't you think he's scouting you out, waiting for you at your weakest moment when you let your guard down to take you down? Whitfield said it this way. If we would therefore behave like good soldiers of Jesus Christ, we must always be on our guard and never pretend to lay down our spiritual weapons of prayer and watching till our warfare is ended by death. For if we do, our spiritual foe will quickly prevail against us. What if, what if he has left us, right? You know, what, what if you don't sense him there in your life tempting you? Whitfield says this, it's only for a season. Yet in a little while, and like a roaring lion with double fury, he will break out upon us again. Satan is such an evil enemy that he seldom leaves us after the first attack. As he followed our blessed Lord with one temptation after another, so he will treat the Lord's servants. And the reason why he sometimes does not renew his attack is because God knows our weaknesses and at times are unable to bear the attack. Sometimes the pause and the temptations uh, come because our adversary thinks it is better to assault us at a more convenient time. So what's the takeaway? Don't give him a convenient time. Don't let your guard down. Don't take your armor off. And he's always testing you for weaknesses in your armor. I want you to just turn over to Matthew 17. I want you to just take a moment. I want you to see how vicious Satan really is. Okay? Matthew 17. Matthew 17, verse 14. And when they had come to, him, to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic, and he suffers severely. For he often falls into the fire and often into water. So I brought him to your disciples, and they could not cure him. He says in verse 16, Then Jesus answered said, O oh, you faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I uh, bear with you? Bring him here. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. And the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why can we not cast it out? And so you know, Jesus gives them instruction on unbelief and, and, and fasting and prayer. But I want you just, just for a moment, I want you to see the vicious nature of Satan here. Um, if you look at the, the account in Mark's gospel, Mark tells you that this boy had been dealing with this since birth. This is a horrible situation, right? Where this boy would throw himself into the fire and throw himself into water. But when you look at this and you compare this with Mark's account, you see the activity of Satan here. And I want you to think about a few things. Parents, you need to pay attention to this and write this down. Number one, the devil is no respecter of persons. He doesn't just go after your rebellious, you know, after you as an adult, right? He's after your children, and I don't want you to miss this. The father said this has been going on since he was a child, so this devil has been attacking this young boy. Number two, notice how early the devil goes after your children. It starts early, doesn't it? Number three, notice the hostility of Satan against your children. Now, I mean, I hope you're starting to put some pieces together as we go through all this, this study and teaching. God has provided spiritual protection through the protection of the home, for example. Uh, this should cause us to pause for a moment and think about all the things uh, we put uh, above spiritual welfare of our children. I mean, you think about it. Most of us here, I think all of us here, make sure that they're fed, they're clothed. We put them in different programs. But do we bring them under the spiritual protection of the Lord Jesus Christ? Are we praying for them? Are we fasting for them? Are we nurturing our faith in such a way that we are ready? Satan has no mercy for your children. He offers no mercy for them. So don't be naive when it comes to your children. There are spiritual enemies out there that, des that desire to come after them. I don't really think sometimes we, we consider how much Satan actually hates them. Because if we did, we would protect them in a different way than what we do. 
So this should, you know, a story like this ought to make each and every one of us more and more vigilant with respect to preparing and training our children. Go back to uh, Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6. So here we have the what to do. Put on the armor of God, Paul says. This is what you're supposed to do. Why? That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Okay. So let me let me stop here this morning, uh, or else we're going to be going a long time. I didn't get as far as I wanted to. I wanted to, to get into the why we need to put on the armor. Well, Satan has two main strategies to come against you. One is tempting you, and the other is accusing you. And so the Bible teaches us that those strategies, right? And so, you know, um, we're going to look at some different schemes that Satan brings against us. Um, so here's a question. How well do you know your enemy? Right? How well do you know his schemes? Because isn't it interesting that, for example, in Genesis uh, 3, God could have just said, Adam and Eve sinned through, you, through you know, creation and man into you know, under the curse, right? Left it there, but he didn't. He provides the details of how the serpent approaches the woman, right? Why? Same reason he provides details all throughout the scriptures of Satan's activity. He wants you to know him so that you can see him coming. Let me just ask you this. What do you do when a serpent comes and starts talking to you? You flee from it or you kill it, right? What did Eve do? Neither one of them. She had a conversation with it. They had a theological discussion about God, didn't they? Now, I hope you understand that when we say Satan, uh, it's kind of like, you know, that's like shorthand for you're going to be confronted with spiritual warfare, right? So, so let me make sure you, you see this. Think about World War II. And so uh, maybe some of your grandfathers uh, went and fought in that war and said, hey, I'm going off to fight Hitler. <laughs> Did they really see Hitler? No. They were fighting against the influences and the power and the sway that Hitler had over an entire continent. Well, this is what's going on here. You may have contact with Satan, but most likely your battles are going to be against his system, his opposition, his tools that he uses. So who does he use? Well, the Bible tells you, you know, 2 Corinthians, we will look at this one here. You need to see this one. 11, 2 Corinthians 11, look at verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles for Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of life. Therefore, is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. Of all the schemes of Satan, I think this is the most dangerous one he has. Uh, one of the Puritans said it this way, of all of his plots, this is perhaps the, mo perhaps the most dangerous to the saints when he appears in the mantle of a prophet or, or silver plates his corroded tongue with fair-sounding speech. But see, what he does is he works within the assemblies to bring division. He works within assemblies to undermine repentance. He works within the tongues of, of those who would spew forth slanders and gossips and lies. And here's the thing, when we let our spiritual guard down, we take our armor off, he can use you. He can use you as a tool to bring division. He can use you. I mean, one of the biggest challenges, and, and this is, you know, I've, I've talked to pastors about this over the last several years. One of the biggest challenges that many pastors have is just like, for example, when you're trying to deal with issues, trying to like say you're trying to bring two Christians who are at odds together, it, it just seems like there's always someone working behind the scenes to disrupt repentance and reconciliation. Well, where's that come from? Somebody's let their spiritual guard down, and they become a tool. Here's another thing. Satan is, is, we need to understand this, he's deceptive, he's very cunning. And the one of the ways we know he is working is when someone comes to you and says, did he really say that? Now, I'm not talking about individuals who come and say, hey, God's word says this. I want to understand it so I, I can apply it. I'm not talking about that person. I'm talking about the person who says, this is what God's word says, and because it's going to cost them much, it's going to challenge them in their lifestyle. Did he really say that? Right? I mean, how else do you explain Christian feminism? How else do you explain Christian homosexuals or Christian adulterers? Right? How do you explain them? Did he really say I had to be faithful to my wife? Right? They bring questions to the table. That's how you know he's active and working. We need to know his schemes. Number one, so that we're not deceived and fall victim to his sway. Or 
we don't become a tool of his to be used to bring division within the church of Christ. Well, we'll talk about the schemes of Satan next week. We'll, we'll dig into this a little bit different. So Paul says, put on the armor of God, the armor that's been provided by God to withstand the schemes of Satan. So this is Paul's warning to us. And he's saying, I want you to learn Satan's tricks, his schemes. And so um, we've got to study out his ways. We need to know our enemy and how he operates. And this is what the Bible is teaching us about him. So if you want to have victory over your enemy, you've got to put on the armor of God. You've got to learn his schemes so that you don't fall victim to his schemes. So you know what one of the things Satan will certainly do is they'll say, sit him at a table. Just enjoy the pleasures of this earth. What's wrong with it after all, right? And while he's tempting you with the pleasures of this earth, he's going to be tempting you the entire time to turn away from your God. And unfortunately, many Christians do this. They've fallen victim to this. So my exhortation and encouragement to you this morning, we've covered a lot, but uh, you need to heed Paul's warning. That you need to armor up. You need to put on Christ first. So Lord willing, we're going to continue this study out, and uh, we're going to dig deeper and deeper into this armor. Father, we come to you and we ask for strength. We ask for your mercy, your grace to operate within us so that we might stand firm upon the battlefield. Um, Father, may, may we just hate and despise the fact that your name is being dishonored the way it is within this land. So, Father, we come to you this morning. We ask you to forgive us for when we come with impotent worship, we come to the table with compromise. Father, we pray that you would grant us strength and boldness to Bring every area of our life under the dominion of Christ. May we walk in his strength. May you revitalize the way um, we come in here and worship. Father, we pray. Yeah, we desire revival. But, Father, we don't want more of what we have in this country. So, Father, we need reformation. So, Father, we pray that you bring reformation within our own lives, that we might be a blessing to others and encourage them to reform their lives, and that we might have a revival of true biblical worship take place in this land. And so, Father, we ask you for your blessings upon this assembly here. We ask you that we might stand and, and, and engage into warfare uh, within this assembly so that we might take it into our homes, that we might take it into our culture. So, Father, we ask that you would be with us this day, and this should be a great day of celebration if we, as we talk with one another about the triumph of God's grace, of your, your, your mercy and your grace within our lives. We pray that you would give us many stories to tell our children, that they might tell their children, that they may have stories to tell. Uh, may, may we not be guilty of not passing the great works of, of you, God, to our to the next generation. So, Father, may we stand in awe and wonderment of your, of your greatness, your power, your might. Uh, you are the one who spoke everything into existence. You are the one by the power of your word that holds everything together. And Father... May we always sing and give and sing praises to your name for your, your acts of power and redemption throughout history. We thank you for sending the Lord Jesus Christ, the captain of our salvation. May we as a people stand close to him and always follow his lead. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.